Hey, it's Mike here, and today a whole video on choline because not that many people know much about it, and the meat and egg industries have taken advantage of that with a sort of fear-mongering campaign. If you watched my dietary guidelines video from a few weeks back, you know that they were pushing the choline message on the USDA Dietary Guidelines Committee. Eggs have varying amounts of each of these nutrients and are one of the most concentrated sources of choline in the American diet. But I was just in the UK, I just got back, and it appears that this whole attack has crossed the pond. Epic vlog coming soon, but in the UK this started with an editorial by one nutritionist in the British Medical Journal, and we will focus mainly on that in this video, but it continued with a, a smattering of articles in the press. Leading nutritionist claims vegan diets can stunt brain development. HuffPost gets on board. Plant-based diets could negatively impact your brain health, study reveals. And it's really misleading to call this a study. We'll get to that in a bit. And then the kicker was this one. Could a plant-based diet be making you dumb? Although they do say, in short, probably not. But come on, that's quite a title. So we're gonna unpack all of this and look at the incredible developments on that original paper's conflict of interest, which is very interesting. We're gonna look at a bunch of other research, use some logic, and finally ask the question, should we be eating more animal products, more saturated fat and cholesterol in order to get choline? We'll see. So firstly, what is choline? Well, choline is a water soluble vitamin like essential nutrient only recently determined to be essential because our body does make it. But the question is, does it make enough? Maybe not. Now it's used for cell membranes, metabolism, brain function, and lipid transport. So don't get me wrong, this is important, but there's a reason we haven't heard of choline, and that's because in the past there generally hasn't been a concern that we aren't getting enough. But hey, if you're trying to promote eggs since you can get enough protein from plants, since it's not legal to advertise them as healthy, or safe because of levels of infection, and you can't even advertise them as having antioxidants because there aren't enough, then you know sometimes you just gotta branch out. So, choline. And we'll soon see what foods are a good source of choline, but spoiler alert, many plants are good sources of choline, which you probably won't hear in these articles. It's important to start this whole thing back in the US. Again, I did a recent video on the US Dietary Guidelines. It was a four hour long original video that I distilled into a 25 minute response video and highlight video. So let's recap really quickly. An apparently neutral choline researcher came forward and said that A, we should be concerned about the shift to plant-based diets because the best sources of choline are animal foods such as eggs and meat. Good morning. My name is Marie Cadell and I'm a choline researcher. The best dietary sources of choline are animal source foods like eggs and meat. However, consumers are often advised to limit these foods in their diet. And that low levels could mean a risk for brain development. And finally, that Americans on average are not consuming enough choline. Only one of 10 US adults meet target intake levels. Yes, that our high animal product diet was not high enough in eggs and other animal products. And as I mentioned in the video, that woman from a recent study was funded by not just the beef, but also the egg industry in a nefariously impressive resume. Now by pure raw coincidence, just a few weeks later, after decades of nobody really being concerned about choline, that UK nutritionist, Emma Derbyshire, came out with this editorial in the British Medical Journal, the BMJ. She highlighted animal products as a good source of choline, was concerned about the shift to more plant-based diets, was advocating for a change in dietary guidelines, and finally also mentioned that just a small portion of the population is getting enough choline. So let's look at Emma's study, as the Huffington Post called it, which to be clear, was not a clinical trial, wasn't even an observational study, it was an editorial. And looking to the hierarchy of evidence pictured here, notice an editorial is at the bottom, considered the worst kind of peer-reviewed evidence with the highest risk of bias. It's more or less opinion expressed in a journal. Not all editorials are bad, but they definitely should be examined, and annoyingly, the British Medical Journal sort of legitimized this by further publicizing it with a newsroom report, presenting it with the title, Suggested Move to Plant-Based Diets Risk Worsening Brain Health Nutrient Deficiency. Okay. I feel that they even misled people because at the bottom, they classify this as evidence type, observational, and subjects people. Well, reference some observational data on people. No, this was not an actual study that was performed. There were no people in the study. It should really say evidence type, editorial, subjects, none, classification, misleading. In the editorial, she says that low choline intake influences, quote, the risk of lifelong memory function and possible risk of neural tube defects. 
And we're really gonna cover that in a bit, but much of the article was spent praising eggs and meat as great sources of choline, essentially recommending an increase in some of the number one heart disease causing foods. Eggs are the main source of cholesterol. Heart disease is our number one killer. She also you know, encouraged consumption of meat, many of which are carcinogenic. Cancer, number two killer. It's quite irresponsible when you consider that choline can be found in many plant foods in good amounts. Something that she doesn't mention, huh, interesting. So why is that? This is a little suspicious, but going down to funding, she claims that there was no source of funding here. It was just her, you know, sharing her opinion. You know, it's not part of a specific grant by any type of industry. But no funding doesn't mean no conflict. And this is where things get really interesting. When I was researching this video, I was like, oh my gosh, I found something because I was originally sent to the first posting of this editorial, which said a newer version is available. I then clicked on that and a newer version was available. They've clearly updated this several times, yet the body of the editorial doesn't seem to be changed. So where's the change? From the first one, looking at competing interests, quote, no, there are no competing interests, but from the second one, Quote, Emma Derbyshire is a member of the Meat Advisory Panel, which receives an educational grant from the meat industry. Oh, it gets better. The third time. Quote, Emma Derbyshire has written this article independently and did not receive funding for writing it. It was written solely to raise choline awareness. She has, however, consulted for and advised the Meat Advisory Panel, Marlowe Foods, the Health Supplement Information Service, and the British Egg Information Service, amongst others. What others? So we're adding the choline supplement companies and the egg industry, interesting. And then for the fourth one, quote, Emma Derbyshire was a fictional person created by the egg and meat industries, but has been recently 3D printed out of pure choline covered by a layer of false human skin. She is powered by animal blood, but sources of power are not considered sources of funding. Sorry, it appears that they actually took down that fourth version, so. For a little bit more details, yes, the meat advisory panel is funded by the UK meat industry and it's known for such gems as it's, you know, members saying, quote, red and processed meats do not give you cancer. And that's after the WHO came out with their findings, yep. This is actually a pretty shameful sequence of updates and explains exactly why the public is so confused, but let's, let's focus on the actual ideas in the paper, let's go. Here's a little taste of her bias in her choline food chart. First of all, beef liver is disgusting and is not part of the diet, so let's just cross that right off. By contrast, here's the most exhaustive resource of choline levels in foods. It's by the USDA. And in fact, what she was citing on choline levels actually cited this paper initially. And from that chart, yeah, eggs are high, but whole grains go neck and neck with meat and legumes are right there as well, though it's not on that chart. And remember Emma's concern. You know, it's concerning given that current trends appear to be towards meat reduction and plant-based diets, but replacing meat with legumes doesn't appear that it's actually gonna lower choline intake. To throw in some other examples of higher plant sources, here is soy flour, here is wheat germ, here's quinoa, and here's peanut butter. Why didn't she mention any of these foods? I think we know why. All right, now let's get to recommendations. The recommendations she puts forward are the Institute of Medicine's 1998 ones, which is 550 milligrams a day for men, and 425 for women. So you wanna to listen to the egg industry and, and use eggs to get to maybe 500 milligrams a day. That puts you at 374 milligrams of cholesterol, which is over the commonly recommended 300 milligram limit, which is usually accompanied by a 200 milligram limit for people who have heart disease. And actually from our current US dietary guidelines, people should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible. The Institute of Medicine's recommendation is arguably too high. From this study, it was based not on brain damage or brain function or anything like that. It was based on preventing fatty liver disease in likely people eating the standard American diet. And perhaps most importantly, they didn't look at different doses for preventing this. They simply chose a dose and found that it worked. And that's what the recommendations were based off. And plus, if vegans really weren't getting enough, wouldn't they have like an epidemic of fatty liver disease? I mean, from this book, quote, dietary choline deficiency causes the rapid development of fatty liver. There doesn't appear to be an epidemic of fatty liver disease in vegans, and that is a disease that's accompanied with increased inflammation. Vegans on average have about 30% lower levels of inflammation, worth noting. Now, of course, the egg and meat industry went for the highest recommendation, but it's really, really worth mentioning the European Food Safety Authority's recommendation, that's official EU authority, of 400 100 milligrams per day for adults in general. You know, this is almost 20 years newer, it's from 2016, and they say that it is, quote, based on the mean intake from healthy populations observed in the European Union. Now, obviously, just because a healthy population has a certain intake doesn't mean you require that intake to be healthy. You know, that European population probably also has, you know, a few hundred milligrams of cholesterol a day that they're eating, obviously not required. 
Now just for fun, here's a single vegan meal with some quinoa, broccoli, and pinto beans in you know intuitive amounts, not just 100 grams. And it reaches over 300 grams of choline with just 500 calories or a quarter of the average calorie need. All right, now let's get into the brain stuff. One of the main things here that they highlight is the potential risk of neural tube defects, which is things like spina bifida and being born without a brain. Yeah, they go straight to people's greatest fear, which is their children. Back to the American choline researcher, she was mentioning a study that found that association between low choline and neural tube defects. Higher maternal choline intakes are also associated with a reduced risk of having a baby with a neural tube defect this newer study, for example, found no significant difference in pregnancy choline levels between healthy and neural tube defect pregnancies. It's also worth mentioning that Emma Derbyshire didn't really make a strong case for this. In fact, she kind of highlighted the looseness of it, something you won't really see in the articles. She says of the European Food Safety Authority statement on choline, quote, at the time, evidence in relation to choline consumption and the maintenance of normal neurological function, cognitive function, or brain and neurological development was not thought to be sufficient. Meaning this is quite a speculative connection and it is not really validated by the EU's authorities. But what we do know to be intimately connected, what is likely the leading cause of neural tube defects at about maybe 50 to 70% of them is a folic acid deficiency. And as I've mentioned several times, because vegans eat so much folate in the form of legumes and leafy vegetables, this study found that the vegans had about four times lower folic acid deficiency rates than the meat eaters. And another connection worth mentioning is neural tube defects and diabetes during pregnancy, but from the Adventist studies, vegans had 78% lower risk of all diabetes. So no, a vegan shouldn't sacrifice these massively lower neural tube risk factors for this tenuous choline connection, which may not even exist, especially when you can get choline from plants anyway. And just to get the words of an expert in here looking to plant-based news, they covered this and said that, quote, according to Professor Emeritus of Nutrition and Dietetics at King's College London, Tom Sanders, choline can be made in the body and is abundant in many plant-based foods. Says there's no justification for suggesting that plant-based diets risk damaging brain development and how his own research on vegans in Europe and the USA find the growth and development of vegans and vegetarians to be normal. Which is of course echoed by the largest organization of nutritional professionals, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, saying that a well-planned vegan diet is suitable for all stages of life. As for adult brain functioning, neither of these choline researchers presented anything that was very persuasive, but it's worth noting just from a logical perspective that a population like the Okinawans, based off what they were eating in the 40s, for example, and how they had extremely low levels of cognitive decline until, of course, they went on a more westernized diet, you know, it makes it seem like we're probably getting enough choline in general. And for fun, a little anecdote, two-time world memory champion, this Swedish dude, is vegan. Also, vegetarians who don't eat that meat with choline have higher IQs, an association but worth mentioning. Smugness complete. But the kicker to all of this is that high levels of choline intake could definitely cause some problems, as this paper mentions. Now, looking at a study of 7,000 people, higher choline was associated with a bunch of cardiovascular risk factors. We're talking triglycerides, glucose, BMI, body fat. In fact, it might be a useful biomarker to diagnose heart disease. As for the mechanism, I have a recent video on TMAO or trimethylamine N-oxide, which appears to promote atherosclerosis. This paper actually highlights that exact mechanism. Choline breaks down to trimethylamine in the digestive system. And from this paper, you can actually see a spike in TMAO levels after people ate eggs. Vegan gut bacteria doesn't convert choline into TMAO though, unless you give them supplements, which this study did, which raised their TMAO levels and also raised their platelet aggregation levels, something you definitely don't want. You definitely don't want clumpy blood when you're trying to prevent heart disease. In the end, the dairy and egg industries are clearly pushing this message on a unified front. And honestly, Emma Derbyshire's BMJ article was embarrassing in terms of the conflicts of interest there. Sadly, a lot of the articles have not mentioned the updated conflicts of interest. So if you got time, you might as well feel free to message them and be like, hey, this is worth adding. Another thing that both of these choline researchers were pushing was having choline supplements, which is absurd considering what will happen with TMAO and heart disease down the line. Finally, you know that if the population that is probably eating the most animal products on the planet, most eggs and meat, still doesn't have enough choline intake, you know that there's an issue here with this logic. And then finally telling people, 
able to increase their choline consumption through animal products is just bad for people's bodies, bad for the environment, and bad for the animals. All right, let me know down below what you think about all this choline stuff, if I maybe missed any choline points, and feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't hit the notification bell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.